Okay, everybody, have a seat. That's enough fellowship. Cut it out. <laughs> hey, as I said earlier, today we have a guest speaker. It's Dr. Dan Moorhead. He's a Christian psychiatrist. He went to school at Pepperdine, a great Christian school. He also studied at the Menninger uh, Clinic. He is uh, presently a, uh, he's a psychiatrist, and um, he's at, uh, he's the Assistant Professor of Psychiatry at Tufts Medical University, Tufts University Medical Center. And uh, he's board certified and all that good stuff. And it's so great to have him here. He was with us for this weekend for a mental health conference for the last two days. And it's such a blessing to have him here. He's with also his wife, Carol, who's a rector, a senior pastor at uh, Episcopalian Church in Medford, Oregon. She's there in the darkness because she's so humble. Um, she's over there. Raise your hand. There she is. So it's great to have Carol with us. And uh, it's been great having uh, both Dan and, and Carol with us. It's, um, he's uh, also uh, very much into Kung Fu. And he is a fourth degree black belt. Can you believe that? And as you all know, I too am a black belt in Kung Fu. But in my school, that was the first level. And uh, I just stayed there for all the time I was at. But you're fourth level. That's amazing. They come into the light and they can't see you. So um, it's so great to have people who are shorter than I guess preaching. And I just couldn't find any. So. <laughs> Um, and being a hobbit, I just welcome everybody. <laughs> but here's Dr. Dan Moorhead. It's so great to have... Do now, you have two Dr. Dans. You have a paradox today. So, here is uh, Dr. Dan. Hey, thank you all for your warmth and your welcome. Oh, I love this place. Um, Hawaii, but this church too, having been here several times. Uh, how I don't I and oh sorry I don't want to start off by being negative, um, but Al the coffee guy in the video, how am I supposed to follow that as a speaker? I mean I've seen this twice now. I've got tears in my eyes both times, uh, and then I'm supposed to come do something inspirational, you know. And this and then I'm listening to his talk, and there's this inspirational soaring music when he talks. I don't know if that happens at the coffee bar. But um, if I ever have a superpower, I want that to be my superpower. I start talking and there's this inspirational music that lifts everybody up. Um, unfortunately, I'm a mere mortal here with my feet on the ground, but I do want to um, talk about and, may, and hopefully tap into something powerful, which is something deeper, better, greater, happier than we have besides fear and anxiety. And I'm reminded um, on this topic of something a, a Catholic friend told me. He said, have you ever noticed in the Bible that every time an angel shows up to talk to somebody, the first thing they say, it's almost always one thing that they say first of all before anything else, which is be not afraid. Be not afraid. And um, Pope John Paul II, the great Pope, when he visited um, Eastern Europe and toured Poland, um, uh, and helped bring about the fall of, of communism and tyranny there, that was his catchphrase. That was the one thing he said over and over and over. And so there were these massive crowds. And he would say, be not afraid. And, you know, he, he lived it as a bishop in Poland under communist rule. And he was tapped into a deep power. And they said the effect was just electric in the crowds. It just ran through that something fell off of them and that that uh, was the energy that began the, the peaceful revolutions that brought down the Iron Curtain. So that's what I hope to tap into um, here in our own little way. And I do want to declare myself an expert from the very beginning. I'm not going to try to compete with Al. I, I know better. But... Um, I'm an expert not because I'm a psychiatrist and I talk about this with people every day, but because I'm 56 years old and I have spent 56 years of my life in worry. I know all about worry. There is very little about worry that I have not personally experienced. So I came into the world, according to my parents, I was a rather you know, dour, serious, stress-prone child 
And um, they say that literally, I don't know if I believe this, you know, my parents are kind of shifty, but that literally I didn't smile the first year of my life, and then in my 13th month I tasted ice cream. So thanks be to God, and then I smiled. But I used to worry when I was a little kid, a preschooler, uh, before you had to strap down kids in the car, back in the good old days, I would, I, none of us were seat belted, so I'd put my head on the front seat um, uh, where my parents were driving in the car, and I would obsessively stare at the gas gauge, telling them over and over, we don't run out of gas, we don't want to run out of gas, the gas is getting low, the gas tank's getting empty, please don't run out of gas, I would worry. And then when I was older, uh, like in first, second grade, I would wake up in the middle of the night worried and afraid, it would be dark and quiet, and I would be afraid that someone was breaking in. And uh, sometimes I would get up and look around the house, you know, shaking. One, one time I heard a noise, I got up. I thought, this time I know I really heard something. I creep into the living room. There's this deep voice that starts talking. I'm petrified, I jump. Um, turns out somebody left on the radio, and it was a late night radio show <laughs> of some, some deep male voice talking. So I survived that, you'll be interested to know. And then uh, later on, you know, I used to worry as I got near to baptism that, that the world would end, Jesus would come back and I would be unbaptized because we, we had more adult baptism in my church and that I would go to hell. And so on and on and on would take many, many sermons to detail all my worries. I became a doctor and do you realize there are things to worry about as a doctor? It, it, um, yeah, any, you know, little mistakes can hurt people. Once there was a, a test in um, pathology, microbiology, where the, uh, the professor put in a question, and the question was different because of the position of one camera. It was true or false, and so almost everybody missed it. We were all mad at the professor, and he goes, hey, you're a doctor. If you write something wrong in the orders, you can kill people, so don't bother me about this test. Then later on, uh, I was a student, um, first hospital where I rotated the night before surgery, that was my first rotation, um, they would give patients a dose of Valium to make them relax. In the old days, you would come in the hospital the night before your surgery. You didn't have to get up at 3 a.m. Well, you did have to get up at 3 a.m., but you didn't have to drive in in the dark. And so they would give this medicine Valium, and a normal dose of Valium is 5 milligrams, but we'd give them 10 milligrams to really make them sleep the night before. And so thanks be to God, this was not me, but the med student, who was also on the rotation, wrote out the orders for the senior doctor to sign, and instead of putting 10 one milligrams of Valium, guess how many milligrams he wrote down? 10 one a 100 milligrams of Valium, 10 times the normal dose. And this woman, who was an older woman, slept for a grand total of four days. But she woke up and had her surgery, and it, I guess you could say it worked out. But, you know, any little mistake, lives hang in the balance. So I'm a big worrier, and I feel um, that I'm not alone in this, and that that's part of why Jesus brought it up. And there's a pretty long passage in the Sermon on the Mount about worry. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you shall eat or, or drink, or your body, what you shall wear. It's not life more important than than food and drink, and the body more important than clothes. Don't be like the Gentiles who run after these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be yours as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Beautiful, beautiful words to those of us who worry. Um, and they also call us deeper, don't they? Because it's kind of like, you know, there's a storm raging and Jesus is in the prow of the ship and Jesus isn't worried, Jesus is fine, but the rest of the apostles are freaking out. And so I'm with the apostles freaking out and Jesus says, don't worry, and that's great, but I still worry. And sometimes with my patients in the office, after I've known them for years and they, they know what a strange place I'm coming from, we'll talk about their worries and anxieties and I'll just say, hey, don't worry, don't worry. And then I'll laugh because we all know it's not that simple, those of us who are worriers. 
it goes very, very deep, and it takes more than just the bald statement of, hey, don't worry, what's the point of worrying? And I think Jesus has more in mind here, because he's addressing human beings. Jesus knows what it's like to be human, and he knows that we all have anxiety, right? All human beings have anxiety, and in fact, all mammals have anxiety and fear. Cats have it, dogs have it, we all have it. Overall, this has been studied, all over the world, fear and anxiety are our most common human emotions. They're the most common emotion across all mammal species, and so we go through the day, we deal with all these threats and worries and stresses, finally we go to sleep at night, and guess what emotion is most on people's minds when we dream? This has actually been studied, they wake up people at night, and yeah, there are good dreams, happy dreams, but the most common emotion when we dream is anxiety and fear. And after that's anger. So we are deeply, deeply wired for worry, and that's the reason that of all kinds of mental health disorders, mental illnesses, the number one most common category that people have is anxiety disorders. Panic attacks, obsessions and compulsions, like washing my hands over and over, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, which has a lot of anxiety, 20 to 30% of the population at some point in the lifetime will experience not just worry or fear, but a true anxiety disorder that gets a life of its own and won't let go. So this stuff goes deep, deep, deep into our nature, all the way down to our genes. And, uh, you know, I am one of these people who has an anxiety disorder. And so I know from experience, what I'm going to say <clears throat> as I try to um, dwell on the words of Jesus is powerful. And if you have an anxiety disorder of whatever kind, it's very powerful. But if it's an anxiety disorder, there may be something that's clicked in your brain that has a life of its own that you need other things like specialized medicine or talk therapy for. And so I would encourage you to do all of the above. We don't have to choose between our faith and mental health, do we? And we don't have to choose between our faith and mental health treatment. But what I am going to say today is powerful and proven to be powerful for every kind of anxiety. Even if you don't have an anxiety disorder, I know that deep, deep down, there's a fearful child inside you, right? Inside all of us, when things go bump in the night or when life gets rough, we get scared. If somebody doesn't have fear, they're not a normal person. I am, as a psychiatrist, I am very worried about that person if they truly don't have fear or anxiety. Now, some of you aren't worriers, but you know what? That's because somebody else is worried for you. And we see this in mental health treatment all the time. We see a family and one person comes in and they're so worried and anxious and we work and work and work and over months and years, their anxiety starts to go down. Guess what happens to the anxiety of other people in the family, usually the spouse? It goes up. As one person goes down, the other goes up because there's something that's not even conscious that's hardwired into us that says if the people around me are worrying, hey, I'm good, I don't have to worry. They're going to worry. They're worried if we're late for church. They're worried if we can pay the bills. They're worried what's for dinner. And so there's that thing about the youngest kid, right? Classically, the youngest kid never worries. You know, things just happen, and mom and dad are worrying, and the older kids are worrying, and the youngest just goes along with it, and everything is fine. So worry applies to us all, I think, which is why Jesus has this long uh, statement on worry. All right, so what is Jesus saying? Is it more than just don't worry? Well, somehow I bet it is, knowing Jesus as we do. So what Jesus says instead of worry is to seek the kingdom. So what's he talking about? Well, let's go back to the whole Sermon on the Mount. Jesus actually um, discusses a number of troublesome common emotions in the Sermon on the Mount. He talks about desire, like desire for adultery or desire for money. Anger, like getting angry at other people or even feeling murderous to other people. And then fear or worry. And in each case, what Jesus says is, look more deeply and look into your heart, right? So, yes, don't commit adultery, but look into your heart. Are you committing adultery and lusting in your heart? Um, don't make money number one in your life, but look into your heart. You can't serve God and money. Which one of those is on the throne? 
And the same thing with worry. Uh, Jesus says, look into your heart and look into your thoughts and don't be like the Gentiles going over and over, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, what shall we wear? Jesus' way is always, always to look inward, to go to the heart of things. And in this way, Jesus is contrasting his teaching from the Pharisees. Okay, the Pharisees weren't all bad. They were the group that was most like the early Christians. But what the Pharisees did was, understandably, they read the old law, and it says, do this, do this, do this, you know, uh, repeat this, say this, go here, do this, don't work on the Sabbath. And they said, 600 and some commandments, we're going to memorize them, we're going to do them all. And that was great, but Jesus said, you know what, if your heart isn't right, if you don't look within, it's not going to work. And so Jesus says your righteousness has to be greater than the scribes and the Pharisees, not meaning you have to be more perfect in your behavior, but meaning you need to go within and work on yourself inside and not just work on the outside and what you do with actions. So Jesus' way is the inside out, right? Always go back to looking at yourself, working on yourself every single day, make a habit, make a discipline of doing that. And then... When it's worry that bothers us, what do we do? Jesus' answer is very clear. You turn your eyes toward God. God takes care of every little flower. God takes care of every little sparrow. And God is going to take care of you. God made you. God loves you. And God will take care of you. Right? Our God is a nurturing God. God cares for us like a mother and a father. And what we need to do is get our minds back on that, not just one time, but over and over and over. So, this is something I think that's implicit in Jesus' words. This is kind of my version of unfolding this or trying to apply this, but I think it's strongly implied. Uh, Worry's going to be in your mind, right? You don't have to get up in the morning or the middle of the night and say, hmm, should I worry? Yeah, I think I'll do some worrying. Does anybody do that? I don't. I hate worrying. I would, if there was a switch to turn it off, I mean, okay, I'm changing my mind. That would be my superpower, a switch to turn off worry. Um, It's involuntary. It just happens in our minds. And so one thing we need to do, weirdly enough, is become aware that we're worrying and catch ourselves as early as possible when we're worrying and then interrupt it and say, wait a minute, this is worry, and say, I'm going to think about God. I'm going to think about the words of Jesus or in some other ways, I'm going to refocus on God And then when I focus on God, all my worry is instantly gone and I have no more problems. No, when I focus on God, after a few seconds, I'm distracted, other things come up in my mind, and I have to refocus and repeat this. All right, so let me just go into the cycle a little bit here. So I find myself worrying. Oh, I become aware, look, I'm doing it again. I'm worrying again. I put a label on it. I put a sticky note on it and say, this is worry forget this. Now, every time in a Bible study, Bible class, Sunday school, Christian education class that that I've been in a group that looks at this passage, which I have since childhood, somebody rightfully brings up, well, what does that mean? Don't, you know, don't worry about tomorrow. Am I not supposed to plan for retirement? Am I not supposed to think about my kid's education? Am I not supposed to worry about, I don't know, changing the oil on the car? Because the car would eventually break down? And the answer to that is, of course, that worry is not the same thing as planning for the future, and it's not the same thing as dreaming or processing or figuring things out. And you can tell the difference pretty easily, because if there's some, a situation you need to face and address and figure out and make a plan, if you face it and make a plan, you will feel better. You'll feel relief, right? If I have to give this talk and it's kind of worrying me or making me anxious, if I sit down and get something done on it, I feel a lot better. If I'm worrying, I just feel more worried, right? And so thinking and planning actually gets to some uh, new thought or idea or result, whereas worry just puts my brain in the circle and I go around in the same circle and the same subjects and the same words over and over. You know, if people could read my thoughts, would they be scandalized? Oh, yes. Would they be bored? Yeah, after about 10 minutes, they would be so bored. It's boring to me. These same worries and thoughts over and over, the rut gets deep, the habit gets deeper, 
They just keep running and running and they don't go anywhere and that's worry. And worry wants to take up all of our downtime, concerns, uh, stresses, negativities. Um, but in fact, actual planning doesn't take that long in practice, right? There are a few things that are big, giant projects, but most of the things that we need to do, you know, 30 minutes and you've, you've figured out what you need to figure out and all the rest is worry. So once you're aware of it, you, you put a sticky on it. Now that is not to be in denial about real problems and real struggles and real fears in life. Uh, life is hard, life is serious, life is painful, bad things happen, but what this unmasks as we challenge ourselves not to worry is the fact that I can't control it. And, and within worry is some kind of weird, bizarre, mythical idea that I can control stuff with my mind, right? Like I have patients who joke that I gotta, I gotta worry when I fly on a plane to keep the plane in the air, right? If I don't worry about it, something bad will happen. You know, if I don't worry about my kids, something bad might happen to them. And of course, the only thing worry does is slow us down and make us more efficient in dealing with actual problems. Um, but to stop worrying, part of what we face is, I'm not God, and I'm not in control of virtually anything in life. I don't control this pandemic. When I get on the plane to fly over here, I have zero control over what's going to happen on the way or if there's going to be a problem. Um, I look at my kids. Do they listen to me? Do I control them? Ha ha. No, I can't control them. Sure don't control my spouse. I go to work. I do the best I can. But honestly, I can barely control myself and I don't do that perfectly. So worry is giving up all that implicit um, assumption that's part of our, our fallen human nature that says somehow I control this or with my mind, I'll keep something bad from sneaking up on me and happening by being anxious and fearful. And instead, it's letting go and saying God is the creator, God is the father and mother. The only security I have in this life is not money, no matter how much, not my job, no matter how great, not even the people around me or family. Everything in this life is temporary and fallible and will let us down. And the only thing, the only thing that we can depend on and have security in is God. And uh, if you don't believe this, then you can do like me as you try to depend on everything else and one thing after another ends in disappointment. All right, so when worries come up, it's, it's very tricky. You know, unfortunately, the part of your mind that worries is as smart as the rest of you, so it will think of all these reasons, all these new reasons. You dismiss one worry and another will come up, right? So what you do is it's like, you know, it's like a four-year-old who's begging not to go to bed or something. Don't get into the argument. Don't fall for that. Don't try to reason with them. They're not interested in reasons. They just want to be in a back and forth and a struggle so they don't have to go to bed. And worry just wants to worry more. So it'll think of what ifs, what about that, this, what about that. Uh, I just try to remind myself, you can't cross a bridge till you come to it, right? So worry will bring up all the what ifs, all the contingencies, you know, what if COVID, what if uh, my job goes south, what if the economy, what if so-and-so is mad at me. You know what? Don't try to figure all that out. Put a sticky note on it, that's worry, and then focus on now and today, and more importantly, refocus on God. So how do we do this? Um, well, it seems obvious, but then again, once you start to do it, like many of these inner things, it becomes slippery and elusive. So one thing we can do to, well, bottom line is focus on God in whatever way that you feel connected to you and you feel helps you and you can sense the presence of God. That could be memorizing and repeating Jesus' words on worry. It could be um, what monks in the Eastern tradition have done a long time, which is the Jesus prayer from the Gospels. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a poor sinner. And you keep going back to that with every breath, every, every thought that strays, you bring it back to that prayer. Brother Lawrence, the practice of the presence of God, um, was, a, was a simple man who said he visualized the heavenly throne room over and over and over, and he always went back to that in his mind, always went back to God in his mind, till it became a constant thing that's always in his mind, right? A Cloud of Unknowing, this book from the Middle Ages, said, pick a name of God, 
or an attribute of God like love or peace and repeat that one word over and over and over. And when your mind starts percolating and worrying and stressing, you interrupt it, label the worry, and then you go back to your sense of God, your thoughts, feelings, connection with God. Keep going back to God until it becomes a habit that's more deeply ingrained with worry. Okay, so you do this once, what happens? Pretty much nothing. You get distracted and go on and you're just as worried as, and uptight as before. So you do this over and over and over. You just constantly seek first the kingdom. This in your mental life becomes a priority. When you're not busy with something else, you're busy with this. And so over and over and over, you refocus on God, then you get distracted, then you refocus on God again. If you're really a worrier like me and it's a habit, stopping this is like stopping a runaway train. Okay, you put the brakes on a train and it takes miles and miles to slow down and stop. You cannot stop a train instantly. The brain is so complicated and these networks are so widespread, you start to put the brakes on and do these things, it will take a long time to gradually rev down the worry till you feel more and more peaceful. It will take months and years, but do it. Do it relentlessly and it will work. And you will be following the way of Jesus, which is you look in your heart, you work on yourself on the inside, then you let that percolate to the outside. You work on your life on the outside. And then when you've got all that in order, if you should ever get that far, then you can start worrying about everybody else and helping everybody else. And that can sound very uh, self-focused, selfish, even sinful. But um, think about it. Uh, how do we give away something we don't have? Right? If I don't have peace in my heart, how can I offer peace to others? If I don't have the love of God uppermost in my heart, how can, I, how can I help bring that to others? So working on ourselves is actually the best thing we can do for people around us. If you don't believe that's the best thing you can do for the people around you, you go home today and ask your family. Ask your family if you need to work on yourself. And you know what they'll say? Yes, here's a list of all your flaws. You need to work on yourself, please do. At least that's my experience. All right, I'm reminded in closing about the great story later in Matthew uh, where there's the storm and Jesus walks on the water and the disciples see him and Peter is brave enough to say, Lord, let me come to you. And Jesus says, yes. And Peter is fine until what? Till the gospel says he looks around and he sees the winds and the waves. And then he starts to sink. And I used to think, oh, you know, poor Peter, no faith. Then I realized, wait a minute, this is about me too. When I have storms in life, when I have problems and pains, winds and waves, what am I looking at? Am I looking at Jesus or am I looking at the winds and the waves? Am I focusing on all my problems or am I focusing on my Lord? And it's a struggle, but I have to bring my eyes back to Jesus over and over and over. It's like the voice said from heaven during the transfiguration, this is my beloved son, what? Listen to him. Listen to Jesus. Turn your ears to Jesus. Turn your eyes to Jesus. Not once, although we do this once in baptism and commitment to Christ, but there and then over and over and over and over till my life my eyes, my ears, my heart are centered around Jesus. So that's a choice that we make in commitment, and it's a choice that we make over and over and over, even down to hundreds and thousands of times a day until that is so deep in our hearts and minds that you can't separate this habit of turning to God and God's love from who I am all the way down to my neurons, all the way into the deep places of my heart. So there in the deep places of your heart, as Pastor Dan comes up to help us offer this invitation, um, uh, Jesus is waiting, right? Jesus, we don't have to look for Jesus. We don't have to run around and find Jesus. Jesus is waiting. We have to go to the honest places, the deep places, the painful, the worried places in our hearts. And then if we ask for Jesus, if we seek Jesus, if we open the door to Jesus, Jesus will be there in a heartbeat. And it will be in Jesus' time, in Jesus' way, not my time and my way, but he will come to you. If you don't know him, 
If you haven't met him before, he will come to you. Thousands, millions of Christians in history have experienced this. And this is our call, not just those of us who hesitate about conversion, but those of us who wake up every morning in this human condition in which we find ourselves and start worrying rather than being happy and grateful for the joy that Jesus gives us, who came not to give us more burdens, not to give us more tasks and commands, but to take away burdens and to take away tasks and to take away commands and say, you don't have to worry about this anymore. You know, as Dr. Dan said, that whenever we deal with faith or with Jesus, we explore um, the, the, uh, the deep places. And as you've heard me say earlier, we always want our services to be participatory and interactive. And I would like to lead us in a prayer. And for some of you, this may be a point when we realize all of the anxiety and worry in our lives that maybe we've been on the fence and we're saying, okay, this is it. I just want to follow Jesus on this now. I'm, I'm tired of being in this kind of this whirlpool of worry. And okay, I've heard that Jesus offers to be our Lord meaning he can be in control and not our anxieties. I've heard him say, come to me all you who are weary and let him take care of our burdens and that it's worth following him. So I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And for some of you, this may be a time for a first time commitment or some of you a recommitment that may be been de just derailed by some anxiety, and it's like, okay, I got to get back to this and make sure he's the Lord. So please join me in prayer. Lord, this has been a rich hour or so of, of worship. It's been a rich time of praising you. It's been a rich time of seeing some models of faith like Al Cosina, who follows you so closely in so many areas and turns that into service and faith. And Lord, there may be some here today who are saying, okay, okay, this is it. I've heard so many messages or I've just walked in here for the first time and I want to follow this Jesus, this real Jesus. And so Lord, if there's anyone here who wants to commit their life to you, If there's anyone here who says, boy, I really need to recommit my life to you and really establish you, establish you as Lord, may they just say this simple prayer with me in the silence of their heart as basically sorrow, sorry, thank you, please. Where we might be saying together right now, Lord, Sorry that I have ignored you for a while. Sorry that I have not trusted you with my anxieties and worries. I'm sorry I've just been off the mark. And now, Lord, thank you for always forgiving me. Thank you for always having unconditional love. So please come in to my life. Send your Holy Spirit. And I really want to follow you and commit my life to you to be a fully committed, dedicated follower of you. No more playing games. I won't be perfect, but I want to be mature in growing towards and with you. So please come into my life. And similarly, for those who are recommitting their lives, just sorry, Lord. But thank you that you're forgiving and please come into my life and fill me more with your Holy Spirit. And now as we continue in prayer, if, if there's anyone here who just said that prayer with eyes closed and head still bowed, I as your friend and pastor, if you just might raise your head right now and 
the Lord will be delighted and pleased. You're, you're putting a stake in the ground. You're putting like a, your signature on the dotted line saying, this was it. So right now, feel free. Just raise your hand just for a bit. And I, as your friend and pastor, will confirm that before the Lord. Lord, you've seen our hearts. You know our commitments. You know where we are. We praise you and thank you that you died for us. No greater love is there than a man giving his life for another. But you're not just a man. You are fully divine. You are God who took the form of a human. So thank you, Lord, for what you did for us on the cross. Thank you for your phenomenal forgiveness and grace and mercy and the future that you provide for all of us and that you desire to be a friend, our friend. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for helping us in the storms of life. In Christ's name, amen. I do want to take a time to show our mahalo and gratitude to Dr. Dan for what he shared with us. I hope wherever you are, in your kitchen or in your living room or in your office or at the beach, um, that through all this technology that you're feeling how much God loves you and you're feeling the Holy Spirit. And... Um, I just want to mention a few things before I do the benediction. Here in the room, if you want prayer, our prayer team will meet right outside uh, in that corner, just outside the glass doors. And uh, the prayer team will confidentially and encouragingly uh, listen to your prayers. Um, on the website, uh, you can see Dr. Dan's message later, and so you can tell your friends about it. But also next Sunday, he'll be preaching at New Hope Windward, our neighbors down the street, and he's going to do an entirely different sermon because he's a workaholic. No, I don't know why, but he, he just wants to be fresh uh, with all who he ministers to, and so you can see that online too for another message. Okay, I think I've hit all my... Announcements, And so let's, uh, for those of you here, uh, please stand as I give a final blessing. And then Roz will come up in a second. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and its countenance be upon you. And may you know deep in your heart the wonderful love of God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And may you cast all your anxiety on them. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in Christ's name, amen. God bless you all. You may be seated here in person. For those of you online, we are so grateful that you have been with us. And we hope to see you next week. So aloha, ahui ho. See you next week. God bless.